Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, and welcome to the fifth installment in my little video series chatting about the albums of Peter Hamill. So for this video, uh, we're going to be talking about one of my absolute favorite periods in his solo uh, catalog. This is the late 70s period featuring the albums, The Future Now, PH7, and of course, A Black Box. Now, uh, I've put um, little timestamps in the description there, so if you do want to skip ahead to a point in the video when I'm talking about any of those albums individually, you can uh, feel free to do so if you so please. Um, but yeah, like I said, this is uh, the late 70s, is one of my favorite periods in Peter Hamill's solo career because it is one of the most experimental. Um, we get some really, really you know, unique and bizarre songs at times on some of these albums. And I think the reason that that is, is that um, these albums were released just after Vandegraaff Generator split for the final time. Um, of course, they got back together in 2005, but um, when they broke up in 78, it looked like that was the last time. So at this point, Hamill is really, really um, trying to develop a way of working that's going to be very distinct from what the band was doing. I think there's an argument to be made that some of the solo albums recorded prior to this era um, do kind of lean towards Vandergraaff Generator in some way, shape, or form. And I mean, you could argue that's always going to be the case because, of course, Hamill's voice is so distinctive. You know, whether he's singing with Vandergraaff or he's singing for a solo project, there's that very, very common thread that's automatically going to be there. Um, but I mean, there's some of the, you know, Chameleon and um, uh, Silent Corner both have Vandergraaff songs on them. Um, in essence, so uh, this is the first time where we see him really trying to find his own way of working. He's really taking his solo career, you know, particularly seriously at this point. I'm sure he's always he's always taken it seriously, but um, you know, with the band breaking up and all that, um, it was time to uh, to get serious about solo recording and find different ways of working. And um, you know, across these three albums, he's really throwing everything, including the kitchen sink, into the proceedings, which is uh, which is why it results in such a unique uh, moment in the catalog. And like I said, some of the most experimental songs. Uh, we also get lots of really great, you know, straight ahead songs as well. So it's not all bizarre. The, the albums are still, um, I think, nicely balanced ultimately. So, um, yeah, let's get on with it with The Future Now. So uh, this was released in 1978. And um, interestingly, this was actually recorded while Van der Graaff was still active. It was released after the band had split up, but while he was putting this together, there was still, you know, they were still possibly hanging on to the thread that Van der Graaff might survive. Nonetheless, I think Campbell was aware that their time was about up, so, you know, there would have been um, no small sense of urgency going into uh, recording these songs. But, uh, yeah, it was recorded just after... Um, just after the uh, live recordings for Vital were, were done uh, at the Marquee Club, so that's kind of an interesting tidbit. Um, and if you compare this to Vital, it's a, it's a completely, completely different thing. Even if you, if you compare this album to uh, much of Hamill's solo career up to this point, it's a completely different thing, musically and lyrically. Um, I think one of the, uh, on a musical level, you know, we, we see some of the raw sonic experimentation that had taken place on uh, pieces such as Magog from um, In Camera, but um, he's applying them specifically to songs in this case, whereas Magog is sort of, you know, a big 15-minute, you know, experiment in and of itself. We get songs on here which are, um, you know, it's, it's still that pure sonic noise, but they're created with the purpose of putting lyrics on top of them, which is quite interesting. Uh, and of course, you know, later on in Hamill's solo career, that would be, you know, kind of a standard thing. Anything can be applied to create a song. Um, so that's quite interesting. We also get some drum machines and whatnot, which is a new thing. Um, though there's some tracks with violin as well that was introduced on the previous solo album, Over. Um, so that's all quite interesting. And lyrically, there's there's quite a difference with, with uh, this album as well. Um, in Hamill's own words, he said he wanted uh, something of a less, less of a dogmatic take on things um, than he had done previously. So we get a lot of songs that deal with more social-oriented topics. So there's, there's kind of a different attitude with the voice on this album as well, which, you know, when you compare it to everything that had gone on before, it would have been so, so very fresh. I think, you know, the, it, it fits with the period as well. You think of, you know, late 70s and, you know, all the big grandeur of, you know, long songs and prog epics and concept albums. I mean, you know, so they say at that point it had kind of been, you know, it become very unfashionable. Um, and with stuff like, you know, punk coming in and new wave, I think it, it was fertile ground for Hamill to really find, um, 
some new methods of working, right? So um, yeah, really, really good album. One of my one of my favorite albums, I if I if I must admit. So um, it opens up with a song called "Pushing 30. Um, we get the nice count in, which uh, again, right off the bat, that's a, a, a different sort of attitude that, that, that's uh, that's coming through with that. Um, and the song itself is, is is quite nice. We get the beatbox in there, nice um, kind of acoustic guitar rock song, and um, it's it's a fun song. It doesn't have the weight of some of the other. Um, uh, Peter Hamill's Peter Hamill pieces. Another notable thing with this album, of course, is the song lengths. Much, much, much shorter. Uh, but they're not necessarily light songs as, you know, uh, Fool's Mate or uh, Nadir. I mean, there's still weightiness to some of these songs, but I guess a different voice. Anyway, back to Pushing 30. Great little song, very fun. Um, it's literally about uh, Pushing 30, kind of talking about um, his own career and experiences in the music industry, and uh, yeah, it, 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 it's a fun track. Nothing too serious, but um, you know, good way, a good way to open the album, get things moving along. We get to the second track, which is the second hand. Now, this is where we can tell right off the bat that things are going to be very, very different from here on out. Um, drum machine, it's based on a drum machine and, and just a little jam on the bass guitar. Really, we get a cool little groove. Hamill, the bass player, that's a, that's a very interesting topic in and of itself. He, he does have a unique approach to the bass, and uh, as we go further along his solo career, we can see that approach become that approach become more unique. But uh, Second Hand is a great little groovy bass-driven song. There's some, some nice um, acoustic guitar chords on there as well. David Jackson supplying some very nice uh, tasteful saxophone on top. And overall, it's a very chill sort of a track. Um, yeah, even the vocals, it's not, it's not that you know, a typical shouty, intense vocal. It's much more laid back and much more subdued. But um, create create something really, really unique. And there's some great versions of the second hand as performed by the K group, uh, which will be the next video. But yeah, second hand's a good track. Moving on to track three, we get trappings. Now, uh, for all intents and purposes, this is um, the standard Hamill acoustic guitar song, but. There's there's a different voice to it. Once again, uh, again, kind of talking about possibly the music industry. It's about um, well, it's about the trappings of success. You know, the more successful that you become, the more you know, um, uh, strangleholded you become as well. It's, it, I don't think that strangleheld. I don't know what the, what the actual word is there. But uh, this is a great a great line that kind of sums the song up is uh, did he sell out or was he sold in which kind of sums up the lyrics. Really notable about trappings actually is uh, his use of backing vocals. Now when we get further and deeper into Hamill's solo career, the backing vocals become kind of an essential part of the of the piece. Uh, and this is a really really early example of him um, messing around with backing vocals and kind of doing calls and responses and sort of contradictory statements and the lyrics and whatnot. So that's uh, that's quite interesting. It's Interesting that it's present on this album, and then it still seems like it takes like a very, very long time to truly develop into what it becomes as we get into you know the later era of solo albums. But yeah, Trappings is a great song. We move to uh, the Mouse Trap brackets caught in. Uh, it's the fourth song on the album. This is the piano uh, ballad, I guess I wouldn't really call it a ballad. This one about uh, an actor, and uh, you know, I, again talking about, uh, I suppose, the trappings of, of, of success to a certain degree once again. Um, and kind of, you know, getting lost in your role and then, you know, you know, losing who you are, perhaps. I don't want to get too deep into the lyrical explanations. That's a whole, you know, I'm not qualified to analyze Hamill's lyrics. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good song. Um, not one of my favorites on the album. Lots of synthesizers kind of placed on top of it, which um, I think you could uh, trace that back to in camera to a certain extent. Songs like uh, Faint Heart in the Sermon or um, uh, No More the Submariner, which is quite interesting. But yeah, Mousetrap is, is an okay song, not one of my favorites, but um, not offensive in any way. Uh, we go to track five, Energy Vampires. Now this is one of the first um, more bizarre songs on the album. We can already get a taste of the experimentation with songs like The Second Hand and, uh, and whatnot, but uh, Energy Vampires is, is, is quite strange, kind of driven by an acoustic guitar, and then we get uh, Graham Smith's piercing violin as well. and. Um, I guess the, the Energy Vampires, I suppose, uh, addresses um, over-eagerness, perhaps, on the part of, um, you know, certain fans or whatever. Not necessarily fans of Hamill himself, but, um, you know, people that can kind of drain the energy out of, uh, out of what you're doing. But uh, it's a really, really good song. There's a great live version as well you can find on YouTube um, with Hamill and Graham Smith, and Hamill's at the piano instead of guitar. 
so it's kind of an interesting, different take on that piece. But uh, yeah, great track, Energy Vampires. Very experimental and kind of jarring and uh, and weird, which is what I like. So um, the first side closes out with "If I Could." Now this is uh, this is an absolutely beautiful song. This is uh, one of the, one of the lost love songs, I would say. It's a uh, written on acoustic guitar and it's a very very simple arrangement on the album and I think that suits it just perfectly. Another example of very very good backing vocals on If I Could as well, particularly towards the end there's some really really nice bits. And um, it's, it's the one song that I suppose you, you I mean there, there, there could be a thread with songs like Over. I mean I wonder if this, this, this song probably would have fit on Over in a different arrangement but um, yeah, yeah, really, really good, and it's a, a song that he's, he's played quite a bit over, over the course of his career, and rightfully so. It's a beautiful piece. Big fan of If I Could. Great ballad. Uh, then we flip the record over. We see the, uh, the other excellent uh, shot of Hamill with his half beard. Fantastic album cover. He actually played at least one show with, uh, with the half beard. There's a photo online on the Van der Graaff website where you can see a photograph of him on stage with the half beard, which would have been uh, an, interesting, an interesting thing to have witnessed. Um, yeah, so anyway, side two opens up with the title track, The Future Now. And this is a really, really good song. However, I don't think the studio version quite does it justice. There's some other versions that were done by the K group and uh, some other solo versions he did, which are absolutely stellar. But for whatever reason, I find the um, original studio version doesn't quite uh, doesn't quite cut the mustard, if you like. Uh, but it's still a fantastic song. Again, mentioning Hamill's bass playing, there's some really cool. Um, you know, unusual um, choices made with the bass. There's just the way that it it, it, follow, it, it hits certain um, chords, but doesn't hit other ones, uh, which is quite interesting. But the future now is uh, is a is ultimately a very very good song. Not one that he's performed um, too much recently, and I, I I've often wondered is is it does he not play it so much because of the line I'm young and it's my right, and uh, well, you know, let's face it, Hamill is not necessarily a young man anymore, <laughs> but uh, it is it is a great song and. Um, and I think in Hamill's own words, he said this is exactly the kind of thing that he was going for. Something that is, you know, still has kind of Hamill traits, but doesn't necessarily lean towards anything he'd done before. So, uh, very good track. Uh, we move on to the next track, Still in the Dark. Really, really good song. Again, this is a piano-based song, much like the previous, much like the previous track, but a little more subdued, a little more quiet. I guess you could say the lyrics are to do with scientific alienation. Um, and yeah, it's just just a great piece. Um, there's some cool Ebo guitar that's performed um, on top of it to kind of orchestrate it a little bit. And um, yeah, just a, just a really nice song. I think it's an over. It could be considered an overlooked song uh, to a certain extent. I've always been a big fan of it since I heard the album for the first time. And uh, as we get towards the end of the album, we get uh, a whole slew of the bizarre experimental songs. And uh, this is this is kind of like the highlight of the album for me because the, so the, the next three songs that follow are absolutely 100% unique. I don't think there's anything out, out there else out there that you could really compare these songs to. They're just absolutely bizarre. And this is where we get, you know, the raw sort of music concrete, music concrete noise. Um, that was exhibited on songs like Magog and now being applied to songs. So the first of these songs is um, Medieval. Uh, this is a really cool thing. Just Again, he's just using tape loops and cuts of um, these kind of vocal um, kind of choir takes that he had, uh, that he had put together. And, um, and then sort of a vicious sort of attack on certain uh, hypocrisies to do with um, Organized religion and whatnot, so a very intense topic, but still very a social topic. It, it, it does it lacks the dogmaticness of something like uh, upon hearts. It's still you know talking about it as a social issue, which is interesting. Very unusual mix too, because we, when we have the uh, you can't see my speakers uh, right here, but I got one speaker here and I got one speaker here, and uh, the camera is actually just in front of my listening chair. But um, the stereo space is quite unusual because you get the big choir that's happening you know right in the middle, and then Hamill's voice is you know, way, way far uh, left, which is uh, like the lead vocal that actually sings the lyrics. So it's an unusual thing, uh, the way that it's mixed. But it's really, really cool. There's a there's a particular there's a part where some of the the guitar feedback or the ebo um, comes up, and the song gets just really, really intense. All the noise is built up, and then it goes back into the kind of main stanza, which is uh, which is fantastic. Really good track. We go on to a motorbike in Africa. Uh, 
another completely surreal track. I mean, I'm not sure how he even done how he even did this. I think it uh, sounds like it's the beatbox, the little drum machine, and it's just been set to some ridiculous setting, and it, it almost creates the sound of a motorbike. Um, and it addresses the topic of apartheid in South Africa, which is quite interesting. And um, yeah, again, it's social topic, bizarre songs, and he actually sings in, a, in, a, in an accent towards the, the very end of the song. He sings with a South African accent, which is a an unusual thing. Usually, it's that um, that classic um, English accent. I forget the, there's a there's a name for it that escapes me in the moment. But yeah, motorbike in Africa is really really cool. Totally bizarre. Nothing else in, exists out there <laughs> like that. Um, we move on to The Cut. This is the, the third in the particularly experimental um, tracks. And uh, at first, I mean, it, it kind of seems fairly straight ahead. We got just that those, those two guitar notes, or the three guitar notes. So that, you, I mean, the, the, you're greeted with a certain sense of normalcy, at least after a motorbike in Africa. You can identify, oh, that's an acoustic guitar. I know what that is. But um, again, just the way that he's using the, the noise and the way that the tape loops are all, I mean, I, could, I couldn't tell you exactly how he put it all together, but it's really, really well done. Uh, and the way that the lyrics correlate with um, the sound effects in the background as well is really, really cool. Um, you know, breathe the vacuum and all, this, all the, the noise is gone, believe there's reason in the cut, and at which point that's where the tape's cut and then all the noise comes back and it's, I'm getting a little too specifically analytical here, but it's a really, really cool track. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the cut. All three of these songs, Medieval, Motorbike in Africa, and the cut are just, you know, absolutely unique. Uh, and then the cut actually segues segues into the uh, the next uh, the the closing track of the album. So we get all kinds of the weird bubbly experimental sounds and noises and that. And finally, these nice nice piano chords come in, and we get um, Palinuris brackets Castaway, which closes out the album. And it's it's a, it's quite a good piece as well. I think I always thought the cut and Palinuris are kind of uh, they're they're associated with each other. The cut, he kind of literally is describing how he's putting together the soundscapes in the background, and Palinuris to me seems to be about, um, you know, sitting at the piano or the guitar and, you know, being on this sea, this ocean of possibilities, and I mean, I, in, in terms of finding the song that you need, or finding, uh, you know, finding, the creating, creating the work that he's doing. So I think that that's a, th those two are kind of tied lyrically to a certain extent. But uh, Pioneers is a great track. I, I love, um, I like the kind of big build up towards the middle there, which is really nice. We also get Hamill playing uh, some uh, some harp as well. Um, um, harmonica, that's the full word for it, which is kind of a unique thing. That's not a common thing in Hamill's. Um, Hamill's world, but there it is. It's on Palinuris, and it's quite cool. So yeah, that's that's the future now. And this and this is I, I got quite lucky to to pick up this particular copy because it does have the original interior interior sleeve, which I'd like to show off real quick. Hopefully that damn glare doesn't get in the way too bad. But yeah, I get very small lyrics and a few other pictures of the half beard, which is quite cool. So yeah, I can't remember where I picked this album up, but uh, remember when I opened it and I saw the inner sleeve, I thought, well, I better have that. Anyway, lean over here and uh, pick up the next album. So now, this here is PH7, released in uh, 1979. And uh, it's funny, you think PH7 would mean um, um, his seventh solo album. This is, of course, his eighth solo album total. So there's kind of a joke in the album cover. PH7 itself um, refers to a perfect uh, balance between acidity and alkalinity, I believe. So, um, so that's kind of interesting, and I think um, PH7 really does. I mean, it, it the Future Now and PH7 kind of go together. I would consider PH7 to be the sister album to uh, the Future Now, and then again, there's you know everything, including the kitchen sink, is being put into the proceedings, and it's it's you know quite experimental. There's a lot of you know noisy, you know wild, bizarre songs, and there's a lot of straight songs as well. So it, it creates a nice collection. Although, if I'm honest, I think I personally prefer the Future Now. Um, P7 is it, 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 it's it's great. There's some essential essential tracks. I think you know the best tracks on PH7 are better than what's on the Future Now. But as an album, I feel the Future Now holds itself together a little bit better than this one. Um, for me personally, PH7 you know starts out real strong and then it really dips towards the uh, the end of the first side and then um, it, it it kind of builds itself back up for the second side. But the the dip in the first side is. Um, 
have, have this is right, my own personal uh, opinion, but um, it, it, it does affect the album a little bit um, on the negative side. But like I said, overall, really, really good songs, and the best songs on here are probably better than the best songs on uh, PH or the future now. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's digest the tracks on this one then, shall we? So uh, it opens up with uh, my favorite, which is a great little acoustic love song. Uh, for for a change, this isn't a lost love song. Much like Vision, this is a very very happy song. Um, and there's some really really nice orchestration with um, the violin on here. Again, we have Graham Smith kind of doing the nice little um, the little accents that, uh, that that bring it all along. And yeah, it's it's a it's almost, again, there's a, a sense of uncertainty with it because it's so tranquil and it's so positive and it's so happy. Not necessarily the things that you're going to expect out of a Peter Hamill solo album, right? So uh, even though you're really enjoying it, you're like, something is something's on the move here. And uh, of course, there is. Uh, you get to the second track, Careering, and uh, it, it's a complete and utter contrast. Right off the bat, we get the uh, the drum machine as well as Peter Hamill on the drums. That's right, Peter Hamill did uh, perform his own drumming on this album and the next one, a black box. Um, and you know, let's be let's, let's be honest, he is not a great drummer, but uh, he's having a lot of fun, and he's he's you know he's he's not doing a bad job to be honest. He's 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 not a guy Evans, but um, you know he's keeping the beat, and uh, I think I think the kind of stiff drumming. Similarly to how the you know the rough production value of Chameleon in the Shadow of the Night adds to its charm, the crazy drumming on this album kind of adds to this album's charm as well. So Careering opens up with uh, the drums and we get this kind of crazy wah wah guitar riff and um, it's a really really good blistering sort of aggressive almost punk like track. Not quite to the same extent as you know a song like Nadir's Big Chance, but uh, there is there's definitely that aggression. Great vocal performance as well. Uh, lyrically, again, talking about um, his own experience in the music industry and how, you know, just, just like anyone else, he can, you know, he can make mistakes as anyone else can. And, 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 you know, I guess certain uncertainties and whatnot. Again, not trying to analyze the lyrics too much here, but, um, yeah, Careering is a great track. Um, I think it's a little underrated, to be honest. It, I don't hear people talk about Careering as much as certain other ones, but it's good. That might be because it's overshadowed by the third track, Portin Down. Uh, this this could be one of the best tracks on the album, actually. This is one of the um, particularly experimental tracks here. It's a, again, he's just kind of messing around with sound, and um, I love. I particularly like love the intro. That weirdo. I'm not sure if it's a synthesizer, but just it just these weird kind of anti-melodic lines that kind of come out of the stereo space right off the bat is really really cool. We get those you know big ugly guitar chords as well, and uh, the the track just builds into a frenzy again intense, intense uh, vocal performance on this as well. Um, again, we're, we're into the, the social topics as well, so we're the important down concerns, um, biological warfare, and it refers to a uh, chemical place in England called Portin Down, um, which is really quite, quite an interesting topic, and uh, great, great song, like I said, one of my favorites on the album. And uh, there's some great versions of Portin Down as performed by the K Group, which we'll talk about uh, later on as well. So yeah, definitely one of the more experimental tracks, very heavy, and um, yeah, it's, it's a classic Peter Hamill song for sure. Now this is where I'll get a little controversial, so we, we have these three really great songs right off the bat, and this is where I find the album dips a little bit. So the next track is Mirror Images. Uh, this is actually, you know, you could actually technically call this a cover of a Van der Graaff Generator song, so this is a, uh, an interpretation of a piece that was originally on Vital. Uh, now I'll say this right off the bat, without much, I don't think there'll be any controversy, the version on Vital is far superior, it's much more expansive, we get the uh, the energy of the live performance plus the contributions of um, the musicians on that album. Um, this particular version is a bit, uh, a bit too subdued, it doesn't, you know, it, it feels like it's, um, it's restricted, it doesn't have, it's, it's, not, it's not allowed to really explode out of the stereo space, it's a little bit flat. Um, it's still a good take of it, for sure. We get lots of synthesizer lines, again, kind of harkening back to in-camera era. Um, but the arrangement just doesn't quite do it for me, for whatever reason. Um, and, you know, it's still a good song, but, um, again, after porting down, it's kind of like, okay, and then you just kind of keep waiting. The next song surely will be, will be much, much better. But uh, then we get Handicap and Equality. Uh, now, again, I'm going to be 
totally controversial. I hate even admitting this on camera sometimes, but uh, this might be the one Peter Hamill song that I, I could honestly say I don't like. When it comes on the speaker, it just, when, it, when it comes to the speakers, I'm usually, you know, okay, I wait for it to, to, to be over. Um, the song itself is very much centered around the acoustic guitar style. Uh, but we also got some nice organ that's put in there, which is uh, what kind of colors it a bit. Um, and lyrically, I think this is this is this might be why I, I have trouble with the song itself. It's uh, one of the social songs, kind of concerning um, handicap and equality, and you know, and, and people's attitudes towards um, people who are. Uh, you know, physically or mentally disabled in some way, shape, or form, and you know, it, it's a, it's a great topic, but there's something so earnest about it. There, there, there's there, there's it's almost like an innocence or something like that. It, it isn't the uh, the Peter Hamill that you know demands your attention or or you know shocks you with some sort of revelation of thought or something like that. It's it's. Um, you know, there, there's an earnestness or something like that, an, an innocence that uh, that just doesn't seem to gel with me for whatever reason. I'm sure, there's a lot of people out there that, uh, that 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 quite like the song, but for me, it's it's it did it, not not a favorite on the album, and it's not one of my favorites overall. There's very few Peter Hamill songs that I that I can that I can say I don't like, and this one might be the only one to be honest. So, uh, sorry, folks, that's 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 the one that I, that's the one that I that I'm not a big fan of, but. Um, there you go. It's it's a Peter Hamill song, so it's still a fine piece. Um, that takes us to what's normally the final side, the final song on side one, which is not for Keith. Um, this is a tribute to Keith Ellis, who of course was Vandergraaff Generator's original bass player. He's actually on the Aerosol Grey Machine, and uh, he passed away in Germany, I believe. That's what it says on um, on the website and Hamill's own notes for the album. And uh, it's just a really nice little piano piece. This this kind of really brings the brings the second side up for me, actually. Um, it's a personal song, but it's not weepy. It's not you know burdened with sadness. It's just it's a nice tribute to um, to someone who sounds like he must have been quite a character. Uh, but I really really like the piano the piano stylings, and it it almost harkens back to uh, Chameleon in the Shadow of the Night in that it is you know a very simplistic arrangement of just piano and uh, voice. Um, similar to uh, In the End, for example. So that that's quite interesting. Not as expansive as In the End. Just a very short little song, but um, it's 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 a great piece. I love I love the, the the piano playing on that. Now traditionally that ends the first side of this album, but I've got a North American copy which includes one of the most bizarre oddities in uh, Hamill's collection, which is a song called The Polaroid. And he sings in this, um, in the song he sings in this kind of over-the-top, exaggerated Cockney accent. And it's just this overwhelmingly silly story about going to the beach and taking uh, a nude photograph of a lady who she suggests that they do it and then he gets the protagonist gets in trouble with the police and it, it's it's just very silly almost Monty Python-esque which is um, you know it's great to see Hamill you know doing something that fun and silly but it's also um, kind of bizarre as well and uh, it, it, the, it was released as a single, and the, it was credited to Ricky Nadir, not Peter Hamill. So that's uh, that's kind of interesting as well. But kind of a throwaway track. And uh, if I'm honest, you know, when I'm listening to this on vinyl, usually I'll uh, I'll cut the I'll pull the needle up before that one starts because I'm eager to get on to the second side. You can flip the side over. Very cool. It's a very cool album cover too. I've always wondered how they how they got it to look the way they did, but. Um, yeah, it's cool. Uh, so the second side opens up with, uh, oh, what's it called now? The Old School Tie, the political song. So again, really carrying on the theme of social topics here. Um, this song addresses politicians and uh, um, how they may be only in it for themselves and for a nice cushy paycheck at the end of a, of a career. Uh, and this is this is a really cool song. This I mean, this is a song that I feel would have been quite modern in 1979. Very stark and very direct musically. Just that dun 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 dun. dun. Uh, it almost feels like a new wave song, but it's very you know it's it's not produced.